Welcome to another edition of Managing Innovation, and we're delighted today to have with us Heiko Spitzek, who is Professor of Corporate Sustainability at the FDC Business School in Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, Heiko, thank you so much for joining us. Um, perhaps I could frame what I hope our conversation will be about. Um, we've got a huge challenge around social innovation basically to help fix the planet with all the things that we're doing to it and all the things that are happening it's going to take a lot of effort more precisely a lot of innovation even the secretary general of the un has said we can only hit those sustainable development goals through innovation so it absolutely has to be about innovation but it's not going to happen by accident it needs change agents entrepreneurs who are going to help make the difference and what's great about uh, what you've been doing and why I'm so excited to have you on the podcast is you're interested in a, a particular kind of individual, a particular kind of social entrepreneur who works in the context of a larger organization. And you have this lovely phrase, you call it impact entrepreneurship, sorry, impact intrapreneurship. And I think that, that, that's tantalizing anyway. I've also had the advantage of having read your wonderful new book, where you've got a lot of stories which bring this to life. So Heiko, thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. Maybe could we start with a little more explanation of what you mean by impact entrepreneurship? Yeah, of course. Um, and thanks, John, for having me um, on your podcast. It's an honor to be with you today. Um, yeah, I've been passionate about first, I think um, most of the people know um, social entrepreneurship. Uh, and I think most of the people um, recognize that Mohamed Yunus, who um, is the inventor of microcredit and the Grameen Bank, um, has introduced the concept and innovated basically uh, a new form of entrepreneurship saying like, you know, I can use business as a platform for positive social and environmental change. Um, bringing like um, inclusion, financial inclusion to millions of people in Bangladesh. And um, as he got more than 2 million people out of, of poverty, he got the Peace Nobel Prize in 2006. Um, but some of you know as well that then big banks um, adopted the concept of microcredit. So um, um, you find microcredit departments in, in the major banks around the globe. Um, so there must be some Yunus inside these organizations. And I'm particularly curious about these um, impact entrepreneurs, how I call them, because um, the, the, the question for social entrepreneurs is always scale. So how do we scale these operations? But imagine like a Yunus working for Goldman Sachs or for HSBC or for Coca-Cola, or for Accenture, or for Unilever. Um, these companies, you know, they attend millions of people every day. And if you can in, inject a little bit of purpose and social innovation into their portfolio, scale is not the challenge anymore. So um, I became very interested in this phenomenon um, because I can see this, um, leading to big scale change if you use your organization, your employer as a platform for it. Yeah, no, that's, that's really exciting because you're right. One of the huge challenges in social innovation is not the pilot, it's not getting it going, it's scaling it. Um, but can I push you then? Can you give us a couple of examples where this has actually happened? Of course. Um, and I think like I like to make the connection with Yunus because if you think about it, he founded the Grameen Bank more or less in 76. Um, he got the Peace Nobel Prize in 2006. So it's 30 years. Um, in 2006, um, Grameen had about 7.5 million customers, out of which they got 2 million out of poverty. Now compare that um, with Vodafone and Safaricom in Kenya. They started M-Pesa, which is um, um, two employees of the organization, um, Susie Loney and Nick Huge. They realized that only about 20% of the Kenyan population had access to financial services. 80% didn't have a bank account, didn't have credit card, nothing like that. So if the poor parents manage to get their boy through education, the boy makes a career in the urban center and wants to send money home to the poor parents in the countryside, somebody had physically to deliver the money there. 
But working for Vodafone, for a a telco company, they realized that about 60% of the population had a mobile phone. So what happens if we allow these people to transfer uh, money just like sending and receiving WhatsApp messages? What happened was like in the first year, they had a million new customers. Today, the whole idea has spread all over Africa. 52 million people are connected on the system. And in 2022, they transferred $314 billion on the system. So this is an immense um, um, case of where you have um, impact, financial inclusion for millions of people in Africa and a really interesting new business opportunity for Vodafone and Safaricom attending the whole population. So I want, and I always challenge my people in class to say like, I want to see your face on the cover of Forbes magazine because you came up with an idea which made billions of dollars for your company. And at the same time and for the same project, you get the Peace Nobel Prize because you brought financial inclusion to millions of people. Now, that's really interesting. I can see on the one hand for companies, there's some big pluses here. There's a chance to enhance profits, but also to boost reputations, to be perceived as operating in a more socially responsible way. This is all good stuff. Uh, But for entrepreneurs, uh, my experience is that's often a very precarious role, uh, not least because you're challenging from within. And as we know, organizations, particularly larger, older, more established ones, they're not always keen on change. It isn't comfortable. It's uh, shaking things up a bit. Um, I wonder if you could comment then on what does it take for entrepreneurs, impact entrepreneurs, to operate in this kind of context? Well, that's a very good observation, John, because um, resilience is a big topic for entrepreneurs um, because most of the entrepreneurs I've I've met, I consider them like the rebels in Star Wars, you know, Uh, because they fight against the system, they fight against the dominant logic, which is basically profit. And most of the companies are, you know, um, even with the ESG and sustainability discussion, most of the companies use social and environmental issues to do better business. While these entrepreneurs, um, their motivation is completely different. They want to use their company as a platform for change. So they basically want to use business for the betterment of society and for the protection of nature. Um, And that obviously creates friction and tension. So one of the examples in my book, um, one of the corporate Jedi masters is Gib Bullock. Gib Bullock worked at Accenture and um, he was on his typical, you know, and this is like for storytelling um, fanatics, uh, you potentially know the hero's journey. So his call and the hero's journey starts with the call to adventure. The call to adventure for Gib started on a typical tube ride to his Accenture offices in London, where he discovered that they were looking in uh, post-war Yugoslavia for consultants to help small businesses um, with their business plans and coming up on their feet again after after the conflict. So he was like, you know, I always thought development work is for nurses and doctors and I don't know, teachers, but not for consultants like me. Um, And then he volunteered and it was such a life transforming experience for him that he decided to found Accenture Development Partnerships, um, which has the purpose to bring top-notch consulting services to NGOs and thus leverage their impact. Now, he wrote a book which is called The Corporate, um, The Entrepreneur, Confessions of a Corporate Changemaker, um, because at a certain point he ended up in a psychiatric ward closed for one week because he snapped. And it's a very interesting tale because like he tells his story about founding Accenture Development Partnerships. And then the next chapter is about one day at the ward. So mental health issues are very serious for impact entrepreneurs because they invested not only with their position and their job, 
but with their whole passion and their heart and everything. So they are all in. Um, but this is exactly the people you want if their passion is aligned with your strategy and your ESG targets. Nothing better than tapping into that kind of motivation from a human resource perspective and attracting of talents. Well, that's a wonderful example, but for me, it also highlights the the courage that individual impact uh, uh, entrepreneurs actually need. It's not an easy ride. Um, one of the things I love about your book is that you've used this metaphor of the hero's journey um, and you've also woven in, and I'm very much a fan myself, uh, you've woven in the Star Wars angle. Um, but what you've drawn out at the end of each chapter is not just telling a story of a journey, but then asking the people who've made the journey to share some of their Jedi wisdom. You know, what have I learned and what would I pass on? And this does feel to me like it's an important concept, but we need a community of practice around impact entrepreneurs. Uh, I wonder, could you comment a little around that and particularly share some of the Jedi wisdom? Yeah. Well, I think like, um, first, this is a very common phenomenon. Um, many of the people who I've met, they haven't um, given themselves an, a positive identity. They realize that they are the odd one in the organization, that they're always like um, against the currents, um, thinking about social environmental impacts, thinking about purpose, um, um, asking all these questions, which the, let's say normal employees don't ask. Um, and when, especially when they start um, um, suggesting new projects and doing changes in the organization, um, they, they swim against the grain and they, especially the junior ones realize that they wanna belong but they are different. Um, and that makes them feel very alone. I think they feel very, very alone. Many of these people think they're the only ones in their organizations. So if you are listening and you identify with this, like, man, I am the odd one, think about it. You might be an entrepreneur. You might be an impact entrepreneur. You might have a different mindset to say, like, you know, I want to use business for a positive impact in society. Um, and that's what makes me different. And that it's not making you odd, it makes you valuable. And um, this is where I bumped into the League of Entrepreneurs, um, which is a global organization, um, which puts all these crazy ones together um, and gives them energy and um, recharges their batteries and, and gives them the feeling man, you are not alone. You have millions of, of warriors besides you. Um, and that's, that's also the message of the book. Like, get to know to these cases. You're not the only one. And you can learn from these Jedi Masters. And actually, most many of these Jedi Masters, as they're getting older, um, they're looking for their Padawans and their, um, you know, their new trainees, let's say. Gib Bullock started an organization which is called um, Craig Barrock, um, where he does a decelerator program for people to say, like, before you innovate, you need to slow down, you know. And he's sharing his stories and takes you to the Isle of Butte in Scotland, um, where you have art and nature and stuff like that. And he brings you together with other Padawans and Jedis in order to learn from each other. Justin De Kosmowski, who was an entrepreneur at SC Johnson, for example, um, he teaches at the Cambridge Sustainability Program. You know, um, so you see, uh, many of these people um, are naturally um, moving towards being some um, Yoda Jedi Master who's training the next generation of of corporate rebels. No, I, I, I love that, and uh, I guess one of the things that uh... As somebody who teaches in a business school, one of the things I like is the power of stories, that actually storytelling really inspires, it communicates. We know this, but in a field like this, it has particular resonance. Um, I wonder, could you give us a couple of other stories which sort of bring this yeah. theme to life? No, and I think like, as you said, storytelling, you know, that, that's a, that storytelling is a weapon for a corporate Jedi. And I think the best story in my book about this is from Catherine Connors, um, 
she is a feminist. She was a feminist researcher and lecturer at a university. Um, and she was um, looking into the power of blogs and social media. So um, as she was researching, she said like, okay, let's start my own blog. And she started a blog, which is called Her Bad Mother, um, reflecting on her motherhood. And her blog was, I think it was Wired Magazine or somebody um, put it in the top 10 blogs of the US. Um, and she got recognition for that. And then she joined a company um, using her storytelling um, um, skills, um, telling the stories of um, rich urban parents uh, and especially about you know her feminist um, side kicked in um, especially tired about stories Disney was telling about princesses getting rescued by prince. You know, the discussion about, you know, uh, girls want to be anything. They can be CEO. They can be whatever they want, astronaut, everything. Um, and she was extremely critical um, about how Disney used their storytelling skills in order to cement um, a very, you know, machist, um, way of looking at girls um, and saying, like, you know, their princesses needing to be rescued by a prince. Well, irony holds that the company she was working for was bought by. Right, exactly. So they were bought by Disney and she ended up inside the enemy. So it's like, you know, go into the Death Star, you know, um, Luke Skywalker going into the Death Star and saying like, you know, holy bully, what I'm doing now. Um, but then she realized that actually Disney is the guardian. It's a cultural institution. It's the guardian of storytelling techniques. It's the institution who inspires millions of kids. So she used her storytelling skills inside and as they were the social media hype uh, Disney just bought she used their power as well to help Disney to think about what other stories we can tell about girls and if you look about the little mermaid now if you look at Star Wars with Ray if you look at at uh, Rock One um, with Jin Erso you see female protagonists appearing, um, taking the roles traditionally held by men. I think there's still a long way to go um, because they are female protagonists, but their stories are still male stories and male journeys. They don't have children. They don't do care work, you know. Um, but there is a change in mindset um, happening there, and I find it very, very interesting um, how... Catherine like ended up with inside the enemy and then um, explained to Disney executives like you are the guardians of storytelling and if you're not changing the the sales of Barbie is dropping you know but if we tell a different story guys and you can show that girls can be anything you know do you have a different market positioning as well that's a wonderful example. And as you say, it hugely underlines the power of storytelling. Um, I wonder if I could take you back into your classroom then, because it seems to me that uh, uh, many people who listen to the podcast are involved in teaching and coaching around innovation. Um, that gives us a chance to inspire, engage, enthuse others. Um, I guess you use some storytelling there. Could you just briefly give us a glimpse into your classroom and uh, uh, how you take... How you take a class, perhaps who've not come across this before, and 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 energize them? Well, well there's you know, um, as I do executive education, and um, my school is pretty much about customized executive education and, and senior management level. So I'll take the the executive MBA example. Um, as business schools are trying to put sustainability in the curriculum, like different suggestions pop up and the executive team, the executive MBA team came up and said like, let's talk about social entrepreneurship. And of course I defend my, my passions. So I, I said to the guys, you know, how many of these highly paid people 
who work for companies like Coke, Unilever, Bali, uh, big banks in Brazil. How many of them do you think like they're going to drop their careers and become social entrepreneurs? You know? And how many do you think have a potential to become impact entrepreneurs? That helped to convince my team to have a special track on impact entrepreneurship on the NBA. It's a three-day quick and dirty uh, program where we challenge these MBAs um, more to the end of their journey because they have then had classes on finance, organizational culture and behavior, on innovation, et cetera, et cetera. On the end of their journey to say like, okay, we give you three days. We give you an introduction to impact entrepreneurship. We tell you the story of these amazing people. Um, we tell you how to create a business case, but you have seen that in finance before. We tell you how to use the theory of change in order to measure social and environmental impacts. And we tell you storytelling. And at the end of the three days, you give us a pitch. What's your project? What are you doing in your organization? How does that make sense to business? How do you sell that to your executive team? How do you measure impact and what's going to be your next step? And what's the call to action? What do you want? To whom are you pitching in your organization? And what do you want the person to do after you've done your pitch? And this has been fantastic. We started this last year. Um, we see projects being implemented in the Unilever supply chain across Latin America here. Uh, we see um, a beer producer re re rethinking their um, post-consumption waste um, methods. Um, we see a chemical company implementing um, bioeconomy models. Um, so there, there are, you know, there's a huge potential um, not only to do class, but to provoke people to use the knowledge they get in our programs and put that to good use in the organizations they work for. That sounds really exciting. I, I'd, I'd love to join that class. I think it feels inspiring. Um, Come on over. I, I'll do that. I'll do that. But I, I guess it does prompt me to say, how do we scale this? Um, where might it go next? Because it's a wonderful idea with proven success. Your book is full of some great stories. How do we scale this? Well, um, we, we founded in 2018 the Center of Entrepreneurship here at, at um at Fundação do Cabral um, with a couple of companies. And then in 2020, the pandemic hit and we said like, okay, that's it, it's over. Um, no more acceleration of these cool projects. But I think um, the pandemic forced us, of course, to go online. So we created an, um, an impact entrepreneurship course in Portuguese, um, which is two months. Um, but can be shorter as well. It's about 20 hours, 20 hours of dedication. But we do exactly that. Like if you are a potential entrepreneur working in a company, this is entrepreneurship. This is how you create an idea. This is how you create a business case. This is how you measure social impact. This is how you create a, a story. Send us your pitch. So at the end of that program, people send us a five-minute video pitch the pitch together with an evaluation sheet goes to the people they're pitching to in their organizations. When we get their evaluations um, and the evaluation of ours, we blend that together and they get a certificate for impact entrepreneurship. So this is, this is through this online course, we have trained more than 2000 people um, at BSF, which was one of our corporate clients here, we've trained more than 800 of their employees in this course. They created about 60 ideas, um, and we have a 40% implementation rate of their ideas. And there you have everything from, from um, reducing costs because of um, energy efficiency or better resource use to new business models which use climate change to get closer to their clients. There's a lot of things. And now um, we're working with them on more dedicated impact entrepreneurship programs where we have the whole story of the online course. But then we say, like, we have a dedicated in entrepreneurship session on climate change or on diversity or on social inclusion or on bioeconomy. So we want to inspire many more people to create 
ideas, get to do the first pitch. And if the first pitch is good, we'll help them accelerate and sell the idea to their senior managers. It sounds amazing. Uh, again, uh, inspiring ideas. And I can see how it, it builds a movement for change, which is what we need. Um, I've got to commend highly your book to anyone who's interested in this field. There's some wonderful stories, lots of accumulated wisdom. Um, I guess we probably have to draw to a close, but maybe can I ask you one final question? Uh, you've, probably seen the, so. you've probably seen this one coming. Um, Jedi wisdom, what would uh, Jedi Master Heiko uh, offer in terms of uh, advice to some someone who might think, yeah, I'm inspired by this. I want to be a, an impact entrepreneur. What would your, your Jedi advice be? Act. You know, there's one chapter on Jedi, corporate Jedi philosophy, which is act. You know, start doing something. Um, you know, um, listen to what your leadership um, is concerned about on social and environmental topics. Um, think about how you can use your skills to better this impact. And, and what are the business impacts associated to this? If they're concerned about climate change, you might think about energy efficiency, which helps you to reduce costs. And at the same time, if you better use energy, you're certainly going to reduce your emissions. So this is good for the planet. This is good for your organization. This is good for your career. Um, and then um, don't be afraid to try. Um, as Master Yoda said, um, the greatest teacher failure is so you need to learn from your errors. And um, there are a few people who have paved the way. Look them up. You find, as John said, like there are examples in my book. Uh, potentially, you know some of them or you know some of these Jedi Masters inside your organization. Um, you know, create connections with them and learn from them. But most of that is uncharted territory. So you need to go. You need to discover and as you know, um, if we look at at the end of Rock One, um, you need to have a little bit of civil disobedience in your organization to say, like, you know, I'm bending the rules. Uh, you might be uh, it might be a good advice to fly under the radar at the beginning and not, you know, um, stick too much attention to it. Um, but if you realize a small project which creates benefits on the business for your organization, helps with the social and environmental agenda, and you deliver that successfully, then the organization might create sufficient trust to let you do the crazy stuff as well. Wonderful. I can, uh, one of my great heroes has always been Alec Guinness, and uh, that was one of my favorite roles of his. And I could hear him mouthing some of those great ideas. But Heko, thank you so much. That's been really interesting. And uh, I do encourage people yet again to look at your book. And uh, yeah, thank you. And hopefully we can talk further on this in the future. But for now, thanks very much. Thanks for having me, John. It was a pleasure.